Hello and welcome. Uh, this is Tom Wallace and a welcome to Florida Funders podcast. Really excited to have you and we have a really excited guest today that I'll introduce here in a second. Um, our podcast is, is really geared at, for, at two different audiences. One is investors and one is founders and entrepreneurs. Um, we really, we're all about learning. And I think one thing that entrepreneurs and investors all share is we'd like to, we'd like to learn uh, everything's always changing out there. And if we can learn from another investor or learn from another founder, uh, that, that's what this is all about. I am extremely excited about our guest today. And again, I'll get to him in a second and introduce him. Uh, some of the past guests we've had on the show include Alex Ohanian, the founder of Reddit, Chris Sullivan, the founder of Outback Steakhouse, Peter Maluth, who is, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, the number one investment advisor in the country, Jeff Binnick, who is the owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and just won his second Stanley Cup, and Steve Raymond, the founder of Tech Data. So those are just an example of some of the founders we've had on. And, and today we have Manny Medina, who's going to be joining us, um, who's an incredible story, and he's both an incredible entrepreneur and investor. But before I introduce Manny, or more importantly, I'll actually have Manny introduce himself. Um, just real quickly, Florida Funders, we, for those of you who are not familiar with us and haven't listened to any of the other pods, we're, we're a cross between or a hybrid between a venture capital fund or funds, we're on our third fund actually, and an angel network of investors. And we're on a mission to really change Florida, we say from Sunshine State to Startup State. And we're on a mission to change Florida into a state known for technology and innovation instead of one that's known for tourism and oranges or strawberries, pick your fruit. So with that, Manny, welcome. So excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Tom. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to uh, to be here today, particularly after you read that incredible list of previous guests. I mean, I'm, you're really scrapping the bottom of the barrel by having me here. <laughs> so. Well, I don't believe that for a second, but thanks for your 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 your, your humbleness, and it, it's one of the many things I like about you. Um, Manny, you have an incredible story to tell. Why don't you start by giving our listeners a little bit about your background? And, and uh, I, I just recently learned um, that, you know, I, I, I knew you, you were an immigrant from Cuba, but I didn't, that's about all I knew. But I just learned that you, you came here at a pretty young age, right? Yeah, actually, I came in uh, when I was 13. Uh, my parents uh, had the uh, courage uh, to put my sister and me on a boat and say, hey, we're, uh, we're heading north. Uh, and uh, basically, luckily, they had the courage and the fortitude to, to leave everything behind and bring us to the greatest country in the world. Uh, so I arrived here uh, and, and uh, Miami was a totally different place when I got here. Uh, what year was this, 60s, 1965. Wow. Uh, and you know, Miami was a totally different place. I mean, the civil rights had just been passed. Uh, you know, what you think of Miami today had nothing to do with Miami then. Um, yeah, I'll bet. You know, the, the immigrants, the Cuban immigrants were beginning to add up. Uh, so there was a lot of commotion in the city at the time, this this whole uh, this whole thing that is happening today with immigrants has been going on forever, I guess. But I experienced it firsthand, uh, so it was a tough time. Miami in the nineteen mid sixties was a very tough time for a young um, uh, kid that, that didn't speak English uh, landing in this. Uh, but uh, but thank God they did it because that's how my whole journey started. Yeah. Well, you talk about you talk about the American success story, the American dream. I mean. Uh, you really embody that. So you 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 get here at thirteen. You go to high school here. You learn the language. I I'm sure pretty quickly. And then what did you do after you got out of high school? Yeah. So look, I, I, like I said, Tom, it was a very tough time. When people say, "What sport did you play in high school?" I always say, "I survived." <laughs> Basically, <laughs> but uh, I've, I've had uh, one person who uh, still, uh, thank God, I still have her. She's five feet tall, and you know, she's the only person that I've ever really feared in my life, which is my mother. And uh, she never gave up on me because I got into a lot of trouble. And then just because of her, I, uh, I, I, to prove that I wasn't going to like it, I went to Miami Day College. Uh, and that was the turning point in my life. I owe us being in this podcast today, had it not been for Miami Day College, I, for certainly I would not have been here. I found a very nurturing environment that I didn't even know it existed. Uh, and I went from being a really mad, angry kid to all of a sudden, and, you know, it really uh, uh, blossoming in uh, education. So I went to, uh, after, after that chapter of my life was over, and I really decided, you know what, 
I, I just wanted to succeed, meaning uh, I, we were very, very, very poor. My dad drove a cab. My mother was a hotel maid. So the one thing I didn't want to, I, I, I just wanted, I wanted to find the quickest way for me to make money. <laughs> when uh-huh. people say that you have, you know, so, uh, so I did. I went to um, Florida Atlantic University, uh, FAU, uh, my alma mater, where I started accounting, became a CPA uh, by, uh, and uh, joined uh, Price Warehouse. Uh, as, a, as an auditor and as a CPA with Pricewaterhouse. And then I, I always say that the best two decisions I ever made in my life was once to become a CPA and join Pricewaterhouse and the other one was to quit. So <laughs> in that order, <laughs> because basically it was a great background and that's how I started. And so what, what was the, the, the turning point or what made you decide to leave this very secure job at one of the top most prestigious accounting firms in the world, certainly in the United States, to go down, become an entrepreneur and start your own company. Well, you know, I, I've never been an accountant by devotion. Let's put it this way. For me, it was a very convenient. I, in other words, I'm, I'm very much of a, I really like sales. I like people. I like, I, you know, I, I like to be able to convince people to do things. And, and that's really what I, my passion. Uh, but I wanted a very a short, for me, I was going to go to law school. I didn't really want to be a lawyer either. So I <laughs> felt that by getting a CPA, it would give me credibility. And I didn't know how. Uh, so I was anxious and I used Pricewaterhouse at the time. Uh, the reason why I joined them is they, they, they realized how important Latin America was going to be. So they recruited uh, a few folks like me, bilingual. Uh, and, uh, you know, typically when you started at the time it was big eight. Uh, you know, you, mm-hmm. you didn't do anything but grunt work. Uh, where Pricewaterhouse gave us expense accounts. Uh, you know, we, I traveled all over Latin America with them. Um, so it was a great foundation. As in the late 70s, uh, Miami was going through a very, to one of its very many booms, right? It was an, an amazing boom. Uh-huh. And I've, I, I had already made a lot of contacts in Latin America, spent a lot of time there. So, and they were, well, most of the Latins were bringing money into Miami to buy real estate. So I, 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 I left and said, look, with my credibility now, I was all of uh, 24, <laughs> but uh, with my credibility as a, as a PWC and a CPA, I began. I started this whole me, my, me and a partner that uh, came out of Deloitte. Uh, we started this practice that basically uh, helped foreigners invest in the U.S. Uh, never, never, never taking any money from the from the real estate side. Just they would pay us to look after their investment after their money. And that's how I started, basically. Uh, okay. And what was that company called? It was Mesa Medina. It was a CPA firm, but uh, we really did very little traditional. Uh, accounting work. We was mostly, you know, kind of uh, uh, facilitating acquisition of, uh, of real estate here. That really led for me learning the real estate business. And that's really how I started as a developer. I began how developing. Long you, how long did you have that firm and when did you exit that? Well, it didn't really, I mean, that firm eventually morphed into, uh, into my development business which was my first company, which eventually went from development to, to how I went into the technology business. And so I, I, we, we changed the name of the firm and began developing, really just began doing small developments and then some real much, much bigger real estate, real estate development? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Office buildings, shopping centers. We did residential. We did all kinds of developments. All I didn't through, even know uh, you had a real estate background. I thought you were just a tech guy like me. <laughs> Well, you know, I really, honestly, uh, uh, I, I like real estate, but uh, the development business was something that I wanted to exit, and I've always liked technology. So I rode the, uh, the wave of the internet in the 90s. Actually, what happened was, uh, which was really a, a very interesting part of my life, glad that it happened, hope it never happens again. But basically, there was a, a if you remember, in the late 80s, uh, in 90, uh, there was a major um, real estate crisis, right? I mean, the RTC, all the SNLs were going under. Yeah. It was just, yeah. you know, there was just such a, and we at that time, uh, for, through no fault of mine, had a very big development, ended up being a big problem. Uh, so anyways, I ended up going to the Middle East. I, um, I had a Lebanese partner who was a great guy, a great mentor for me. And um, uh, I ended up going to help uh, rebuild uh, Kuwait. Uh, I was in Kuwait immediately after the liberation. And then from there, stayed in Saudi Arabia. And that, that it was about for about a three year period, which is great for me personally and business wise. But what happened was uh, it was the very, very beginning of the internet. And, uh, you know, over there, 
I didn't have tech support. <laughs> so it wasn't like, a, you know, so I really began getting more and more into it. And, you know, all of a sudden I said this, I was just convinced that the internet was going to be one of these things that was going to fundamentally change the way that we live. And I wanted to participate in it. That's uh-huh. how it actually started. I wanted to participate in what I consider would be that incredible revolution. And that I made my shift, uh, uh, started by doing what I knew, what, what, what I knew how to do, which is the infrastructure end. Uh, uh-huh. of the of where the internet sits, if you will. Yeah. Well, you called that one right. The internet really was a game changer for all of us, wasn't it? Well, it is. And, you know, I mean, I, to be honest, I couldn't even, even then, I could not have imagined everything that has happened, right? I don't but think basically, you know. uh, right. So, but I just felt, you know, it was so easy, you know, instead of, what do you mean? I mean, I mean, I, there's this thing called AOL and I can go and, you know, go online and find all this stuff. I don't have to go through 59 uh, encyclopedias to uh, to help my kids with their homework. So I just fundamentally said, you know, <laughs> and so I started, that's how I started. I shifted my business uh, uh, more into building the infrastructure where the internet sits or so-called telecom hotels at the time, uh, yeah. basically. And uh, which of course ended up uh, being the, the foundation of the company that I eventually took public uh, uh, data center company. Yeah, I was in technology at the same time and involved in, in the same, maybe a little different end of it. I was involved with Cisco, and Microsoft, and companies like that in p- putting networks into um, enterprises. But you know, I don't think any of us, like you said, really could see where the internet was going. But there is a there is an interesting. I don't know if you know about this or other listeners that back in the early '80s there was an interview with Stephen Jobs that Playboy magazine did. And he literally, in the early 80s, describes the internet. Because they ask him, how are people going to use these personal computers? And he said, well, envision this. You're going to be able to sit in your house with, a, with an Apple II, I think. I think it was even pre-Macintosh. Yeah, yeah, you're right. going to be connected to this network all over the world. And you're going to be able to buy anything you want, have it delivered to your house. And you're going to be able to talk to people all over. I mean, it's just incredible. And he saw it in the early 80s. So anyway. I know, but that's why, you know, that's why he, Steve Job, uh, you know, was irreplaceable, right? He had that that vision. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it yeah. was a little later than him, but anyway. Yeah. I, 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 and so that, that company became Terramark Data Services, right? That was... Yeah, so Terramark Worldwide, uh, basically. So he started by building the buildings, right? And then at the time, uh, there was a, a, a fantastic opportunity to build what has become one of the most important telecommunications infrastructure in the entire world, which is the network access point of the Americas. So the NAP of the Americas, right? Uh, so in the middle, it's in, right in downtown Miami. Uh, it is the most important communications exchange point between Latin America, Europe, and North America. So basically you have vast majority of the traffic of Latin America uh, going through the NAP of the Americas and it didn't exist. So mm-hmm. the opportunity, the opportunity. You were at the time with Cisco. The Cisco became a great partner for us, and uh, etc. But what what happened was uh, we had the opportunity to build it from scratch, and it was very very difficult because at the time, uh, you know, when I would ask people money to build an app, I mean, they had no idea what I was talking about. And an app, you know, what you know, what what are you are you, are you slowing down? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. But I, we did, we built the Map of the Americas, which was an incredible, incredible infrastructure. To be honest, I mean, to, be, to put it in perspective, Tom, when we started, we thought we would have 25, 30 networks. There's about 180 networks in the Map of the Americas today. And basically, so, so it just became, so that was the foundation. Uh, so I built that. Uh, all of the carriers have spent billions and billions and billions of dollars. This is during the go-go days, right? Yeah. Uh, of, well, they were just rushing out there to build fiber optics all over Latin America, and but they had no place to exchange it. So they all came together, created a consortium, a not-for-profit consortium, and said, we want to pick somebody who will build, own, and operate a neutral, a carrier neutral uh, uh, exchange point for us to bring our networks in and serve as the exchange point. So I, I actually felt that this was a phenomenal opportunity, and I kept I mean, it would, uh, it, of course, timing was a little bit off, <laughs> given that uh, we completed it. Uh, the telecommunications industry imploded, the bubble burst for the internet, and then September 11th happened. So, you know, and I was a publicly traded company building that, the map of the Americas. Money had dried up and there was no money to be found anywhere. But I f- passionately felt that this was going to be a very important part of the infrastructure on how we communicated. 
And uh, so I, I actually ended up uh, pulling it through. Uh, there were uh, a lot of hairy moments there for, uh, for a period of time when, if you look back to the Miami Herald, it wasn't uh, uh, whether we were going to file bankruptcy, it was uh, when. <laughs> but uh, we, we, so at that point, I totally exited the real estate business. And I, you know, when I speak today, I speak to, uh, to a lot of young uh, kids that want to, you know, want to succeed. And they all know how to place Texas Hold'em, you know. So I said, you know what it is to go all in? Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what I did. That's what you yeah. did. Yeah. What year was what year was this, Manny? This was uh, not, well. We completed the app in August of two thousand and one. Uh, okay. So all if you remember, Which is Tom, right around the time the, the the dot com bust happened, right? Everything, everything. Teleco industry. Uh, uh, a lot of our customers went bankrupt. Companies like Global Crossing and you know and stuff yeah. like that. So it was just turmoil. But at the end of the day. I basically, you know, and then the, 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 the key was there was no money because everybody was so afraid, that, you know, the bubble bursting and this thing is not, is it going to work or not? Yeah. So uh, it was a tough time to, uh, to be able to, to, to stay ahead. Uh, I mean, I would, uh, now my CFO and I, uh, we didn't give up. And the whole idea was, hey, I will pitch anybody who will give me, uh, I mean, I would, I would find anybody in New York, uh, and I would uh, I would pitch the cab driver from LaGuardia to uh, to my meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, so what was the tur- what was the turning point when you went from thinking, you know, we might have to go bankrupt that you know we're going to make it, we're going to survive, and we're going to thrive? Yeah, I think by 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 it was really literally like kind of uh, a week at a time, and by then then eventually something happened in two thousand and one. As sad as those towers being hit was. If those planes would have hit just up the street at a place called 60 Hudson, the way that the government communicates would have been chaotic because you would have your network equipment in a mountain protected, but the traffic was being exchanged in a very vulnerable exchange, right? Mm -hmm. Just this is the very beginning. So we got some uh, big government contracts uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, because they they said this, we can never be this vulnerable again. Yeah. So they dispersed their network all over the place. And that point, by all three, we were already in the clear, and uh, and then began building the company uh, uh, little by little. Uh, and then at that point, we had already come up with this whole business plan of creating a, you know, you went from that to building data centers, to mm-hmm. then creating all kinds of services uh, like cybersecurity, like hosting, like all kinds of network services. You know, being an old Cisco, uh, uh, yeah. basically. So everything that has to do with, uh, so if you think about the whole IT stack. From the network all the way to hosting, that's what we did. Uh, basically, provided that, and Terramark uh, eventually succeeded, and we ended up selling the company uh, in 2011. You sold it in 2011. I did. Yeah. And I, and I, I think uh, I have here 1.4 billion. Is that what is is, is that accurate? Yeah. The enter- the enterprise value was a little bit over two billion because we had about 650 million dollars in debt, so uh-huh. it was uh, about a 2.1 billion dollar sale. Congratulations. So impressive. That's, that's what a great story. Um, so what'd you do after that? When you, you sell a company and you're probably all so, you know, I, I, I did something I had never done in my entire life. And I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but I was disciplined about taking time off. I had been working since I, well, since I remember. <laughs> and uh, so I disconnected, uh, went off and, and uh, spent a few months down in the Keys, uh, drinking beer, fishing, playing tennis. <laughs> and I came up, the one thing that I realized very early, I don't know if you've ever done this, Tom, but I mean, I had never been like that disconnected, right? Obviously I've taken a lot of holidays, but never totally off yeah. the grid. It's very tough to be off the grid. Uh, I mean, it was really like, uh, you know, really like no, I tell you, it's really, really, really tough. Uh, it was just really like, you know, uh, really like uh, getting off drugs, right? You know, basically, <laughs> be tough. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, and the one thing I realized is I was never going to retire. I, I just, you know, I love what I do. And I came up and I said, you know what, so what do I really like to do? The one thing that I came up with, um, uh, just look, we, I love this business. I think by the, by the time that we sold Terramark, we have become experts in virtualization. We had launched the first uh, uh, enterprise cloud. There was a time that AWS and Terramark were exactly the same. If you look at the Gardner quadrant. Um, we were experts in cybersecurity. Uh, this is also the early 2000s, mid 2000s. So what I said is, you know what, I love, this is just going to get better, better, more exciting. 
So uh, I decided to, to begin investing in companies in the in that sector. Uh, so I created uh, my own little uh, uh, vehicle called Medina Capital Partners as a private equity uh, investing in this type of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just I I always wanted to. One thing that I always bothered me a lot was the fact that you know having founded and created a technology company in Miami, uh, it was very difficult. Miami didn't get any respect from a technology point of view. And I think, I think you and I have shared some of the stories on how Tampa was the same, right? How do you yes. actually get that ecosystem going? Mm -hmm. So I came up with the idea of launching Emerge Americas. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a, it's a great, there's a great article uh, on this month's Florida trend uh, that they've actually described how it all happened. I mean, they talk about me being in the keys and how my, sister, my daughter, Melissa, who runs Emerge uh, together, how, uh, you know, how, she just kept seeing me going up and down. I said, "Look, if we do this, so I Emerge Americas is a is a is a is a. Uh, I came up with the idea uh, and uh, and decided to just do it on my own at the beginning. Uh, and the whole idea was to create this open platform uh, to serve as a place for entrepreneurs, innovators, um, tech, everything that has to do with next generation of uh, uh, of uh, technology to come." And gather uh, no different than you know that and the inspiration was South by Southwest. I don't know if you've ever been sure. kind of that that that, yeah. that thing. So that that was the, the two things that I decided to do: launch yeah. Emerge Americas and uh, and launch my own uh, investment vehicle. Well, and for our listeners or and viewing audience that haven't been to Emerge, it's a it's a fantastic uh, conference show every year in Miami. Draws fifteen to twenty thousand people. Uh, full disclosure, Florida funders just invested in Emerge, and we're a partner of yours in that now. We're so excited about that partnership. Yeah, we're excited. Uh, we're excited having you as a partner because, as a matter of fact, I was seeing yesterday, Forbes came out with this article, you know, that uh, Tampa is actually number one and Miami is number two when it comes to entrepreneurial, et cetera. So I think bringing you guys and us together, it's, uh, it goes well for the state of Florida. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're very excited to be your partner in that. And uh uh, Emerge is is really um, has really put Miami on the map, and that kind of segues into uh, one thing I was going to ask you about. Is obviously COVID has been uh, you know affected all of us, and here in Florida, it just affected us I think a lot differently maybe than other parts of the country. And uh, in many ways, I, I think uh, we benefited from COVID, and that we had people that were locked down in California and people that were locked down in New York, and they came here. And they, they, they learned what you and I already knew and many of our listeners is that Florida is a, a very pro-business state. It's a, it's, it's a, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talent here. Um, there's there's, there's a, a, a lot of opportunity here. It's a great quality of life. And, and many of them have decided to stay. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. And, and uh, because you've seen it from when, when, like you said in the beginning, when you started your first tech company in Miami, there really wasn't much tech here. And and wow, what a change, huh? No, it was very, very frustrating. Particularly recruiting was a very difficult task. I mean, we were trying to recruit some very highly specialized uh, tech uh, engineers and uh, particularly cybersecurity and things like that. And it was, you know, it was very difficult. If you're a number one draft pick uh, uh, in the industry, meaning, you know, you have an MIT or you have a Stanford degree, you've been in a, an intelligence agency for 10 years, uh, you don't. You didn't think of Miami as being your next <laughs> career yeah. step, so it was very challenging. Um, that's what Emerge uh, was was set out to do. Uh, look, at the end of the day, Tom, over the last few, even before COVID, uh, it, it had already changed. Right, basically, you already saw that what COVID did was really accelerate exactly what you said. When people were coming down here, we have such a welcoming environment. Uh, you know, we basically Florida overall. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, we're not. We don't, we don't care where you're from. Yeah. We don't care what you're back. We, mm -hmm. we really care about you and your ideas. And, you know, and, and there's a significant amount of, uh, of just openness to be able to, uh, to accept uh, people. So, uh, and it's a fantastic place to work. So it was already happening. Uh, then uh, what happened was obviously our great politician friends from the Northeast and from the West Coast uh, <laughs> and, their, <laughs> and their tax laws helped us. Uh, you know, you, you cope, yeah. COVID, I mean, basically, uh, I think that, uh, you know, our, uh, we have a, a, a new political uh, crop of young uh, uh, commissioners and uh, state legislators and et cetera, that really understand and believe in what we're doing. 
Uh, that was not the case before. So yeah. basically, you know, academia has come a long ways. Your universities have been up there a lot. I mean, they're really, really, really advanced in cyber and a lot of this. Thing. So, so the state is kind of pulled together. And then what happened, COVID accelerated. Uh, you know, basically it accelerated it because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we were very lucky you know, in the sense that, you know, we were mostly open uh, and, and, and even though everything was being virtual, et cetera, it was not the same uh, uh, issues that, uh, that some of our uh, uh, neighbors in the Northeast uh, and, and, and the Midwest had. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and um, I'm not political and I don't want to get political, but I, I give, I give our, our governor, uh, Mr. Santos, <laughs> a lot of credit. And I think Francis Suarez, the mayor of Miami, and I know you're good friends with him. I mean, he really, embraced all those folks coming down here and it it, it, it was great to see it and uh, yeah well that's what I, I'm, not, I'm not making any political statement at all on the contrary but i do believe that you know it's very important when you when you spend and you bring this talent is for them to understand that our leadership really wants them to succeed now yeah. i don't want to get into exact policies and stuff like that but they and that i think that that that's really what they find today right that uh, you really have that welcoming uh mat uh, saying, yeah, we do want you here and we're going to do everything possible to, to keep you and to help you succeed. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been very exciting. Now, Medina Capital, what are you, what are you up to? Uh, what's Medina Capital working on now and what exciting things do you see out there? Oh, <laughs> that's what's keeping me uh, very busy. So we, uh, in, in, uh, we have made a number of investments, but in 2017, uh, we acquired uh, a data center footprint from a carrier called CenturyLink. Uh, and uh, we acquired a number of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity companies and put it all together under, the, under a company called Sixtera, uh, Sixtera Technologies. Uh, we closed that in May of 17. Uh, it was a big deal. For me, it was a big deal. It was a $2.8 billion deal, uh, wow. the acquisition. I'd call so, that a big deal. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a big deal. For yeah, me, that's a big deal. Story. What I did is I stopped the, uh, I, 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 you know, my commitment to my partners was that I would stop all of the Medina capital activity from an investment point, you know, any big uh, time consuming activity until we saw this through. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a very complicated cover up, taking out all those data centers from a legacy carrier like CenturyLink, which was merging with another carrier called Level 3. So all of that was completed at the end of 19, we spun off the cyber business into a separate company called AppGate um, and Sixtera, uh, basically uh, spun them off too. Uh, I then stepped back as CEO of the company and have two great CEOs uh, that have been with me for a very, very, very long time. One leading the data center business and the other one leading the uh, cyber business. Both businesses are doing phenomenally well. Uh, Sixtera, uh, we just just went public through a, through a SPAC. We, uh, we uh, went public about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, Congratulations, and, by the way. Yeah, we're very excited. The company uh, uh, is performing extremely well. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's the Terramark uh, playbook all over again, right? Basically, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, a movie that we've seen before. So we're excited uh, where the company is right now and uh, uh, continue uh, growing. And then uh, the, the cyber business is a very unique, it's a next generation, uh, what is called zero trust. We've been leaders in the next generation of cyber called Zero Trust or Software Defined Perimeter. Um, you know, our number one target is Cisco. <laughs> to oh, okay. to, to, so basically, uh, which we're uh, doing and the, and the business is just on fire. We're doing really, really, really well. Uh, so that company is also gonna go public through a three-way deal. Actually, uh, my partner in that, uh, in that next, uh, uh, in the next step of this company of going public is uh, uh, John Nadecki, who owns the New York Islanders. Uh, wow. Basically, uh, so you know, he knows, uh, you know, Ontario. So John is a, is a partner, and through him, we're, we're, we're taking AppGate, the company, the cyber company is called AppGate. We're taking that public uh, and uplifting it to the NASDAQ or to the New York Stock Exchange early next year. So, those two companies, uh, you know, I mean, Sixtera is pretty much on its way now, getting AppGate done, and then we'll figure out what else to do. <laughs> Well, uh, congratulations. Uh, that's, that's one impressive story. Manny, I would, I would say, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, that you have had more of an impact on the tech ecosystem in Miami than any other person. As an entrepreneur, as a founder, starting eMERGE, all that you've done, 
when you look out five or 10 years at Miami, what's your vision and, and where, do you, where do you see Miami and, and the state of Florida going? Yeah, I want to make it very clear that this was really, a, you know, it takes a village. I mean, what I had was the idea and I funded this entire beginning. But I mean, when I went out, the first thing that I did is really bring in, I brought in academia, all the universities, brought in government, brought in enterprises, you know, so everybody came together and it was just a story that needed to be told and, and the need was there. So, I mean, I may have sparked it, but absolutely it was, a, it, was it, it really takes a village and, and, and we've had tremendous uh, Amount of particularly one, particularly early on, right? Uh, from the Miami Herald to all the all all our great institutions down here. Uh, mm -hmm. And look, I think today, I you go back to the beginning of our of, of our conversation today, and you see this thirteen-year-old boy getting off a boat in Key West, and uh, and you see where I am today. A big part of that is really because of Miami, and because of Florida. And mm -hmm. I am I am I am so grateful. Uh, that I am just, that I've had just the blessing and the opportunity to be able to, to do this uh, because for me it's a, a way to give it back. I, I would have to live many lifetimes to give back uh, how blessed I've been. So it's great. I think right now uh, with through our collective uh, uh, forces, I think there's a movement that is, it cannot go back. I don't yeah, think. I agree. So even, even if, cope, forget it. I just think it's here. It's lasting. I think our state the state of innovation as, and, 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 and the entire entrepreneurial, it pleases me a lot. It used to be very frustrating when I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or I was in Bogota, or I was in Lima, and you would talk to a young entrepreneur and uh, and the first, they all their dream was to go to Silicon Valley. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. Their dream is to come to Florida. Yeah. So, so I think it's just more the same. I think that diversifying our economy, I think that the whole idea of us not having to be so dependent on you know, on, on using up our resources, our natural resources, and really creating this, this base, which was really the dream, right, at the very beginning. So what I see is very much a, a, a city that will begin to mature. I think, I think the amount of the particular, the last leg that was really, which by the way, you guys participated in very early on, one of, the, one of the most difficult parts here was really opportunities don't want to come where there's no money, and money yeah, doesn't want to come where there's no opportunity. <laughs> so getting that pump prime, that pump is prime. I mean, yeah. you got it's institutionalized. You got massive amount of influx of capital coming down from from the very well established institutions to all kinds of entrepreneurial capital uh, seeking. So all of that bodes very well for our state because basically, it's, yeah. So I and, just and see for our uh, listeners, if you don't know, SoftBank has come here in a big way. Um, Peter Thiel has come here and his foundation fund. Orlando Bravo, who I'm supposed to have dinner with in a couple of weeks, who is yeah, the... Yeah, so, so Orlando Bravo, you know, they are... So Thomas Bravo is one of the smartest cybersecurity investors in the world. These guys, they do really massive deals. Yeah. Uh, and Orlando is not only moving here, but he's bringing the cyber business here. Yeah. I mean, that's a big deal. So yeah, so the, all these institutions that are coming down here is uh, is uh, is uh, phenomenal for all of us. So I, I look, I'm very excited, I'm very glad uh, where we are, and I, I I just think it's going to be a, a lot more of the same, right? I have to say one thing about uh, Toma Bravo. My brother ran a portfolio. As you were describing your background, it reminded me a bit of my brother. He started his career at Arthur Anderson and spent 12 years there, but oh, he really? ran a portfolio company for Toma Bravo. Uh, he's going to be joining me for the dinner. He's actually setting up the dinner. I haven't met Orlando yet. And he exited that company about two years ago and sold it for a billion six. And Toma Bravo did very, very well. well you're, going, you're going to love Orlando, by the way. He's going to be a big, uh, a big uh, part in, uh, and, and, and very involved in Emerge as well. Um, oh, great. So, great. So make sure you, you talk about that. So, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting time, Tom. <laughs> oh, so exciting. Um, Manny, this has been great. I mean, what an incredible story your life has been and what an inspiration to other founders and entrepreneurs. And I'm sure you've overcome tremendous adversity. Thank God you didn't retire and stay in the Keys drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I think that's part of it. The two things I see with entrepreneurs um, over and over again is that they, they love what they do and they have a passion for it. And retirement usually doesn't last very long for them. And then the second thing is, people help them along the way and they want to give back and they want to help the next generation of entrepreneurs. And that's what we're all about at Florida funders too. 
and what my partners and I have been working on for, for quite a while. So um, thank you so much for being on, Manny. No, it's, uh, it's an honor. Uh, uh, congrats to you, Tom, and I look forward to seeing you down here in a couple of weeks. Great, great. Uh, just closing up for our listeners, uh, this is again Tom Wallace of Florida Funders. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm Tom at FloridaFunders.com. If you want to learn more about Florida Funders, just go to our website, FloridaFunders.com, and we have uh, company, we have podcasts out there with, with, and that's this, that's where uh, this podcast will be. And um, we also have companies out there you can invest in and take a look at. So would would welcome you to to uh, join the Florida Funders family. Manny, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate okay. it. Take Thanks. care. Bye bye.